In the ancient Jewish temple, a large veil blocked access to the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God dwelled. It was a constant reminder that sin separated us from God. Nobody was allowed in except for the high priest, and then only once a year. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest would pass through the veil to offer a sacrifice for the sins of Israel. This continued for generations, because the sacrifice could never be good enough. Fortunately, it was just a foreshadowing of what was to come. Two thousand years ago, something changed. A new sacrifice was offered, a perfect sacrifice. One final sacrifice for all of time. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. He paid the ultimate price so that the sins of all men could be forgiven. At the moment of his death, the large veil in the temple, the very thing that represented centuries of separation from God, was torn. Torn in two from the top down, showing that this era of separation was over. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the Holy of Holies once and for all time and secured our redemption forever. Turn to the book of John, if you would, please. The book of John, uh, chapter 19. The book of John, chapter 19. The suffering and the purpose of the cross. In John, chapter 19, and verse number 16. John, chapter 19, verse 16. Uh, in your Bibles. This is uh, one of the accounts of the crucifixion of Jesus. John chapter 19, beginning with verse 16. John 19, 16. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. John 19, now we're ready for, for 17. Verse 17. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a little title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and in Latin. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said that I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I've written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they were crucified, Jesus then the soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four, four parts to every soldier a part and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, let us not uh, rent it or tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled which saith, they parted my raiment among them. For my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister. 
Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciples, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her into his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body might remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. There's nothing that would please Satan more than for every church of the Lord Jesus Christ to, t to stop singing, to stop preaching, and to stop teaching about the blood of Christ. I heard uh, some time ago about a Southern Baptist evangelist that went to preach a revival meeting in a certain church and the pastor of that church said to the evangelist, I don't want you to use the name Jesus this week in your preaching. And the evangelist asked the pastor, why do you want me not to use the word Jesus? And he said, I don't want you to offend some people that are coming to our church. And then he said, the evangelist asked, uh, what do you want me to use? And he said, I'll use the word master or Lord or God, but just don't use the name Jesus because we don't want to offend anybody. Dr. Warren Wearsby, who has a book or a commentary, a whole set of commentaries throughout the Bible that I use often, and Dr. Wearsby is still active in teaching and, and uh, preaching throughout the nation. One of the great uh, Bible teachers and Bible writers was at Union University in 2003, and Junior Hill, uh, the evangelist, Southern Baptist evangelist, was also speaking on the program there at the conference. And during lunch, they were discussing and talking and visiting. And Dr. Wearsby said to Junior Hill, he said, uh, I have a student of mine uh, that went through our college and I taught him the Bible all the way through. Uh, but he has come to say to his music director, I want you to take the word blood out of all the songs that we sing here at the, ch at the church. Because he said the word blood is offensive to some people. And we don't want to be offensive to people. Listen, when you take the blood out of preaching, you just well throw down the Bible. Because this Bible is about the blood of the Lord Jesus. All the way from Genesis through the book of Revelation, all the types in the Old Testament, all is pointing to the blood of Christ. The blood, the shed blood of the Savior is the centerpiece of the Word of God. Now, in talking about the cross and talking about the blood, there's one thing that we must fully understand uh, is that the one that's dying on the cross is both God and man. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, The Word was God. Uh, this, uh, uh, this phrase expresses the deity of Jesus. He was God in eternity past. He was God in the days of his flesh. In fact, he was God the, 
of the nine months that his mother uh, carried him. He was God in his childhood. He was God in his teenage years. He was God in his adult years. He was God during his earthly ministry. He was God on the cross and he was God in the grave and he was God when he arose from that grave. He was God in his post-resurrection ministry. He was God in his ascension and he is God sitting at the right hand of the Father and one day he will come back again for us and he will still be God. He is God now and he will be forever God. It's important that we understand that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is God incarnate. Jesus claimed to be equal with God. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. He also said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. So we see all in the scripture the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 1.14, the word says that he became flesh. The word became flesh. Now this expresses his humanity. And as we study the life of Jesus, we understand that he needed hydration and he also needed nutrition. In Matthew chapter 4, when he was tempted by Satan 40 days and 40 nights, the scripture says that he was hungry. And then uh, in, in John chapter 19 and verse 26, he said, I thirst, I thirst. So he needed hydration and nutrition. He was a man. He needed rest. In John chapter 4, uh, in the encounter with the woman at the well, the Bible says that he sat thus on the well because he was weary with the journey. He was tired with the journey. He needed rest. In Matthew chapter 8 and 24, it says that he was in the, in the lower part of the ship and he was asleep. He needed rest. Also, he expressed emotion. In John chapter 11 and 35, the Bible says he wept at the grave of Lazarus. He experienced temptation. In Matthew 4, uh, he was tempted uh, by Satan. And as you study those passages, he is tempted in every way that we are tempted. You will not face any temptation that Jesus did not face. He also experienced physical pain. Now what I want us to talk about today in this uh, message is the suffering and the purpose of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to be reminded often about the cross. In fact, our minds need to be uh, focused during the day often on the cross of the Lord Jesus. So first let's look at the suffering of Jesus on the cross. And the first part of the suffering is the emotional suffering. In fact, he suffered in three ways. He suffered emotionally, he suffered physically, and he suffered spiritually on the cross. First of all, the emotional suffering. The religious groups mocked him. They never spoke to him, they spoke about him. The chief priest and the scribes mocking him said, he saved others himself, he cannot save, making fun of him. And then they said, if he be the king of the Jews or the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. As I read about how they mocked him, I thought about uh, uh, an inmate being put to death at Riverbend Prison and a bunch of preachers going in there and just looking through the mirror and making fun of that person when he was being put to death. That's exactly what they were doing. They were making fun of Jesus. They, they mocked him. And not only did the religious groups mock him, but the Romans shamed him. It started at the trial. They stripped him and slapped him. And then here's what they said to him. Prophesy unto us, who is he that smote thee? They gambled for his garment. They mocked him. They said, hail king of the Jews. And they falsely accused him. And the Greeks, the, re, the revilers, made sport of him. They that passed by railed on him. Uh, you see, there was a busy thoroughway, a busy road that went by the cross of the, the Calvary, uh, the place of Calvary. And, and they saw what was happening out there. So they came off the road and went out there to the place where, where Jesus was being crucified. And, they, and they, they railed on him. Railed here means that they scolded him with harsh and abusive language. And they were wagging their heads at him. And, and they were saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. 
And they put a sign over him that said, this is the Jews, the king, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Now the sign over Jesus reminds us uh, that the whole world was there. It was written in Greek, it was written in Latin, and it was written in Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And truly he is the king of the Jews, and he is the king of, uh, of all people of the world. And one day he will come from heaven's glory, and he will set up that kingdom reign. But when he was here on this earth, he came as a servant to die on the cross. But one day he's coming as a king. It was the sins of the whole world that necessitated the cross of Jesus Christ. You know the reason this cross is so glorious? The cross is so glorious is because of the sin that made it so uh, necessary. It's our sins that made the cross necessary. That's the reason it's so wonderful. So we have the emotional suffering, but then we come to the physical suffering that Jesus went through on the cross. The physical suffering started in the garden. He was in uh, such agony. He was in such agony that God sent an angel to minister to him. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood. I believe that actual blood was oozing from the pores of his skin. And if blood was actually oozing from the pores of his skin, as I believe and many others believe uh, that it was, then his garments were already wet with blood before he ever went to the cross, before he was ever arrested. You see the agony, the agony of Gethsemane as he prayed, Lord, Lord, if this cup would pass from me. Then the physical suffering of Jesus continued before the high priest. They spit in his face, the Bible says in Matthew 26 and 67. And they beat him with the palms of their hands. Isaiah 52 and 14, one translation has it this way. They shall see my servant beaten and bloodied, so disfigured, so disfigured one would scarcely know it was a person standing there before them. That's how bad he was beaten. They beat him with the palms of their hands and he was unrecognizable as a man. And the physical brutality continued before Pilate. They scourged Jesus' body. Uh, look up in your Bible dictionary sometimes uh, the word scourge and the scourger's whip and you'll find that it was a brutal type beating uh, that, Jesus, uh, uh, that Jesus endured there uh, at the cross. Uh, they took the scourger's whip, which was like a, a bull whip, and they literally beat the body and, and uh, whipped him and plowed his back and, and blood flowed from his body. The scourger's whip, and these people were not amateurs, they were professionals. They were able to literally take the scourger's whip and they were able to just sever one's body. That is, just cut a body in two if they sew a mind to. And they lashed our Lord with 39 stripes. And they put a crown on, the th on, uh, on his head, a crown of thorns. And they hit him on the head with a reed. Now the reed was an object uh, like the broom handle. They literally took the broom handle and they hit him on his head. And they led him away to be crucified. He was now so weak, uh, he couldn't carry the cross. The cross weighed about 150 pounds. And, and he carried it for a while, but, but he fell underneath the load. And when they came to Golgotha, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, which uh, intensified the suffering and the pain that he was already going through because of his lips and his tongue being parched because of the loss of, of liquid from his body. His hands and his feet were pierced with nails as they nailed him to the cross. Now these nails were five to seven inches long and they were square shaft nails. And they literally laid him on the cross. They laid him on the cross and they crossed his legs like that and they nailed, uh, nailed these nails through his legs into the cross and then uh, he stretched his hands out on the cross and they, drew the, uh, they drove these nails through uh, this portion uh, of, his, uh, of his wrist uh, so that he would hang there on the cross. Now can you imagine that kind of pain? 
the bones were all disjointed in agony and his uh, throat was parched uh, with thirst. That's the physical pain. And the Bible tells us uh, of the final brutality poured out upon the Lord. And I want you to go back, if you're still there, in your text this morning, John chapter 19 and verses uh, 32 and following. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. So what we have here is the spear of hate. The spear of hate uh, was kissed by the, by the blood of love, hum humanity, uh, brutality. Human brutality said, I will pierce you, but divine love said, I will forgive you. The cross is the, the greatest manifestation of the love of God that this world knows anything about. Every drop of the blood of Jesus Christ says, I love you. The Bible says uh, that God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us and shed his blood for us on the cross. And then we have the spiritual suffering. The emotional suffering and the physical suffering was bad enough. But the, but the spiritual suffering was the worst suffering of all. We have the divine wounding. Who put Jesus on the cross? Who's responsible for the death of Jesus? Are the Jews responsible? Not any more than we are. Are the Romans responsible? Not any more than we are. Are the uh, soldiers responsible? Not any more than we are. Uh, are the crowds responsible? The revilers, are they responsible? Not any more than we are. Who put Jesus on the cross? Who's responsible for the death of Jesus? Well, God the Father is responsible for the death of Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord. The Lord God in heaven put his son to death on the cross of Calvary. God, the Father, was the only one that had the power to do that. The soldiers didn't, the Jews didn't. And, uh, and all the others there, the crowds didn't, you didn't, I didn't. Nobody had that power other than God the Father. He put the Son to death. Of course it was our sins that necessitated the cross. Our sins were there and it necessitated Jesus dying on the cross. But it was God the Father who put the Son to death on that cross. The divine wounding. And then we have the divine withdrawal. Out of the darkness, Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, why was Jesus forsaken by God the Father? In Hebrews chapter, or Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 13, the scripture says that God is so pure and so holy that he cannot look upon sin. And when Jesus Christ was dying on the cross of Calvary, uh, the Bible tells us that God turned his back upon the Lord Jesus Christ turned his back upon him because Jesus was taking the sins of the whole world upon himself and God being pure and holy could not look upon that scene. So Jesus endured being abandoned by God the Father in order that the wrath of God might be poured out upon him. In Isaiah 53 and 6 it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Listen, that is the ultimate brutality of the cross. That's what Jesus was praying about in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was not praying that the physical pain would pass away. Jesus was not praying that he wouldn't uh, have to die on that cross and, and experience the pain. He wasn't a... He wasn't and frightened by that. The reason Jesus was praying in, in that garden, uh, Lord, if it be possible, uh, let this cup be removed from me. He was talking about the separation, uh, the spiritual brutality that he experienced on that cross of Calvary. Uh, the blood that was shed and God the Father turning his back upon him. He'd never experienced that before, but he hung on that cross and God the Father turned his back on him and Jesus Jesus poured out his blood and he emptied that cup and when the cup was empty he turned it back up and said it is finished, it is over, it is done with on that cross 
the purpose of the suffering of Jesus. He died to fulfill prophecy. He died to fulfill the prophecies in the Bible in relation to his death. The death of Jesus is mentioned time and time and time again uh, in the scripture. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 is the first prophecy of the death of Jesus. Uh, you know what the scripture says there, thou shalt bruise his heel. That is a reference, a prophecy to the death of Jesus on the cross. And I love the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms gives us many prophecies of Jesus and his death. Uh, in Psalms uh, 22, uh, we have a prophecy concerning uh, him being forsaken by God and being scorned and, and ridiculed and his hands and feet being pierced and his clothes uh, being uh, gambled for. And in Psalms 34, we have a prophecy concerning his, bone, concerning his bones not being broken. And, and in 35, we have a prophecy concerning how that he was to be hated. And, and in 41, we have a prophecy concerning how that he was being betrayed by a friend. And in Psalm 69, we have a prophecy concerning uh, him being given vinegar and gall. And the list goes on. We have, we have the brazen serpent the, the ark and the, and the uh, Passover lamb and the tabernacle and all the blood sacrifices in the Old Testament, all of this points to, it's prophecy pointing to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So first of all, he died to fulfill prophecy. And then secondly, he died to satisfy the holy wrath of God. Man is a sinner, the scripture says in Romans 3.23. All have sinned. We're sinners by nature. We're sinners by birth. We're sinners by choice. We're sinners by practice. God has a holy wrath towards sin. God will not allow sin to go unpunished. God will not allow sinful man into heaven. So note the dilemma. Justice must be carried out. Man's a sinner. Therefore, the sinner must be punished. If the sinner receives the justice of God, he goes, he goes to, to hell. But God wants to forgive us of our sins and take us to heaven. That's the reason he died on the cross, is to, to keep us from going to hell. He wants us to go to heaven. Now, how can God punish sin and forgive the sinner? God must show justice and mercy at the same time. How does he do that? There must be, are you listening now? This is on shout. This is what will cause you to shout right here. If you're a shouting person and you know the grace of God and you know what God has done in your heart, I'll tell you, this will bring joy to your soul. God has to show grace and mercy at the same time, and he also has to, show, uh, has to show justice, justice and mercy at the same time. How does he do it? There must be an innocent third party. I'll tell you, it couldn't be a sinful person. There got to be an innocent third party. And Jesus Christ became that perfect third body. A person that is Jesus Christ died on the cross to satisfy the holy wrath of God toward us. He was sinless. He is perfect. And if he had sinned one time, he could not have gone to the cross of Calvary and die for our sins. He had to be the perfect son of God in order to do that. So God, uh, God in Christ died for our sins on the cross. He became that innocent third person to take our sins upon himself. Listen, if you're here and lost this morning, if you don't accept what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary, if you don't accept his substitutionary work in your place on that cross, you'll end up in hell because sin is going to be punished. It'll either be you or it will be the sinner's substitute. Either you accept and believe and trust uh, that Jesus took your place on the cross or you'll experience the damnation and the awful separation and the torments of hell. You must come to Jesus if you expect to escape the awful judgment of God. Jesus Christ died on the cross to satisfy the holy wrath of God for sin. He died as our substitute. One of my favorite verses, 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 24. I hope you got this verse marked in your Bible. Who is on sin, or that is, who is on self, bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you're healed. 
He became our substitute. He died a willing death, a volunteer death. He died deliberately, and he died as our substitute. I should have suffered, the songwriter says. I should have received the crown of thorns on my head. I should have received the pierced side. I should have received the scourger's whip. I should have uh, been spit on. I should have been beaten with the, uh, with, the, with the broom handle. I should have suffered the rejection and the emotional suffering and, and the spiritual suffering. I should have suffered on the cross. I should have been nailed to that cross. I should have been mocked. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died in our place. He died to forgive us of all of our sins. Jesus was treated as a sinner that we might be treated as saints. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Listen, there's only one of two places that your sins can be today, either on you or on the Lord Jesus Christ. If your sins are on you, then you're on your way to hell. But if your sins are on Jesus Christ, you're on the way to heaven. You see, when you come and trust Him and accept Him, uh, your sins are transferred from you over to the Lord Jesus Christ. So if your sins are on Him this morning, then you're on the way to glory. Jesus died for our sins. Notice Calvary Hill again. We have three crosses. We have, we have a man dying on each one of the crosses. We have, first of all, one man died to sin. One of those men who was dying for a capital crime looked at Jesus and said, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. You see that man hanging there on that cross? He saw who Jesus was. He saw him as the Messiah. He saw him dying in his place. There he was dying on death row and he was coming to the end of his life. I used to tell our religious volunteers that one of the, one of the, one of the main things that Jesus did on this earth was to witness to a man who was on death row. You see, this man hanging by Jesus on death row, he was dying on the cross. He's facing death. And Jesus looked at him and said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Today, today. But the other man said, uh, if, you're, if you're God, you save yourself and, and save us. He laughed at him and mocked him. And that day, that man died and went to hell. And he's in hell today. Jesus Christ shed his blood for all of our sins. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of our sins. Now, why did the soldiers pierce the side of Jesus? You see, they had checked uh, both of those men uh, that was dying alongside of Jesus. And they, uh, they broke their legs so that they, it would hasten their death. But when they looked at Jesus and they found that he was already dead, why didn't they just leave it there? Why did they pierce his side? I'll tell you why they pierced his side. Because the Bible says it's the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that cleanses sin and satisfies the holy wrath of God. And that blood was not allowed to stay in the body of Jesus. It was to be outpoured on that cross and given freely on that cross for our sins. Listen, my friends. Every sin that you've ever committed. You think about this week. What about that, that bit of gossip that you carried on this week and you told and, and you shouldn't have even been talking about it. Uh, what about that uh, uh, bit of lust that you let cultivate in your head. You think about uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, bad deal that you made. Dishonest deal. Or, or you think about uh, the sin that you committed in your past. and You think about uh, the things that you're guilty of. I'll tell you for every sin, for every bit of a bad spirit, a bad attitude, and unforgiveness, and bad spirits toward other people. Listen, Jesus died for those sins on the cross. His blood was shed for those sins. Every one of them. 
all the sins in the past, all the sins in the present, all the sins in the future. That's the reason we're saved eternally by the power of God. We're kept by Him because when He died, He paid the sin debt for every sin that we've ever committed or ever will commit. They're under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, my friends. What a blessed people we are. You say, Pastor, I believe what you're saying about the blood of Christ. But how is it applied to me? Well, let me tell you, as I've told you many times. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll close with this. You listen carefully. Here's the only place that we have in the Bible where the gospel of Jesus Christ is just outlined for us. Gives us every element of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand by which also you're saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he arose again the third day according to the scriptures. All those elements, all three of those elements are important. But you know what the most important word in that, those verses are? The little three-letter preposition, for. He died for our sins. If Jesus just died, that wouldn't mean anything. He died for a purpose. He died for our sins. He died in our place for our sins. And the Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Believe. Stronger than intellectual belief. Far stronger than that. It's a trust. A trust. You're willing to come to Him and trust the forgiveness of your sins to His death on the cross. Trust your eternity to Him. Not your works, not your good life, not your good deeds. Push all that aside. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you've got to quit doing anything to come to Jesus. The Bible says that we're to repent of sin and that we're to trust, that we're to believe, put our faith in what Jesus did for us on the cross. And when you do that, I'll guarantee you that God will clean your life up. You won't have to worry about what to quit, what to do, what not to do. God the Holy Spirit will live in your heart and you'll know the things that you're not supposed to be doing when you come and believe and trust. Let's stand up. Our heads bowed and eyes closed. Our heads bowed and eyes closed as Debbie comes to play. First of all, you're here and you're saved. You're a Christian. And you need to follow the Lord in baptism. We've got several here that are waiting baptism. Going to be baptized tonight. Going to be a great night. But there are some others that are saved and you need to follow the Lord in baptism. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. Be an example. Be an example to your family. Be an example to your neighbors. 
The Bible says it's important. Jesus says it's important. Even our Savior was baptized. What other example do we need? An example of the Savior, the Son of God. Go ahead. The Bible says it will bring about a good conscience before God. There will always be a shadow in your life. Always be a shadow in your relationship to God. If you're a Christian and you've never followed the Lord in baptism, there will always be a shadow. Get that removed. Do what God wants you to do. And you need to transfer a church letter. You come on and do that this morning. We'll take care of the paperwork. We'll write for your letter and and uh, we'll take care of that. You won't have to worry about that. You just come share with me uh, your desire. And uh, we'll take care of that. And you'll become a part of our fellowship here and serve uh, in this church. And you're here and you're lost. You know this morning that you're lost. Maybe this week you've been in vacation Bible school and you've realized this week that you're lost. And now you've given us the opportunity. I was talking to Adam this morning uh, our music director, uh, and he said that, that he was under conviction during vacation Bible school, but uh, he wasn't saved till the Sunday night after vacation Bible school. So maybe you're here today, and God has spoken to your heart Bible school that you uh, need to be saved. You come, we're here to help you. We won't embarrass you, we'll just help you. Help lead you to the Lord, as Philip did the Ethiopian in the desert. Help you to come to know Christ. And then you're here, you're a Christian. You've walked away from God. You need to come and repent publicly. You need to come before this church. If you're a part of this church, you need to come before this church and say, I have failed you. I've failed God. Now I've failed the church. I'm asking God's forgiveness, and I want your forgiveness. That's the way it goes. There's no reconciliation apart from confession. Whatever God is saying, you know, if you, you may need to come and not say a word to anybody about what's going on in your life, but you just want to deal with God in prayer right here in this altar. This is the place right here to do it. So as Debbie starts playing, you've heard the invitation. God's speaking to your heart. You come on now. Christian people, you do what God wants you to do. You might encourage a lost person to come and do what they need to do this morning. You step right out where you are. Come on. Do it right now. Don't wait. Come on. Don't rebel against the Lord. Just take that step for Him right now and doing what God wants you to do. And do business with God today. Who will be the first one to take that step for Him? I'll meet you here at the altar. You just come right on right now.
chains are gone I've been set free My God, my Savior Has ransomed me And like a flood His mercy reigns Unending love Amazing Forever. 